Here's something a little different today, a special on something rather specific that I didn't have time to flesh out in the regular episodes. Similar sort of thing to the special a few years ago about whether or not the British engineered the coup in Yugoslavia. Today, it's about the deterioration of relations between the U.S. Army and U.S. Marines after the Battle of Saipan, which became a big deal because of a Time Magazine article. Here we go. I'm Indy Nidell. This is a World War II special episode. You may remember in the regular episodes, back at the beginning of July this year, 1944, when I talked about U.S. 5th Amphibious Corps Commander Holland Smith getting U.S. 27th Infantry Division Commander Ralph Smith fired. The 27th Infantry Division attack against the east side of Mount Tapochow on Saipan a week earlier had failed, to which Holland Smith exploded. The 27th won't fight, and Ralph Smith won't make them fight. He thought that Ralph Smith didn't follow his orders to attack, which is just plain not true. The men did follow his orders and took heavy casualties. I'll go briefly over the events and machinations that came just after this, even though I covered it in the July 1st episode, just to set the stage for what follows over the next couple of months. Okay, so Holland Smith writes to Ralph Smith's headquarters. Commanding General is highly displeased with the failure of the 27th Division on June 23rd to launch its attack as ordered, and the lack of offensive action displayed by the division in its failure to advance, when opposed only by small arms and mortar fire. After that, Holland ropes in Sanderford Jarman, who is slated to command the Saipan garrison once the island has been taken. He sends Jarman in person to Ralph Smith. You might think Holland Smith should talk to his subordinate himself, and you might be right, but that's what happens. Jarman dutifully spoke with Ralph Smith and then reported quite inaccurately that the 27th Division commander acknowledged that his division was not carrying its full share and stated that if he didn't take his division forward tomorrow, he should be relieved. Ralph Smith later strongly denied this version of the conversation. Instead, he had merely acknowledged the difficulties of the terrain and stubborn Japanese resistance. It is true, though, that Holland Smith wants to relieve Ralph Smith. But while army generals have been relieved of command in this theater, it has never been ordered before by a Marine Corps general. Holland tells both Admirals Richmond Turner and Ray Spruance this the 24th, and they're not willing to undercut his authority, so it happens. It is Jarman who replaces Ralph Smith, though only temporarily taking command even while Ralph is actually risking his life at the front lines with the men of the 27th. John McManus has a bunch to say about this and really has it in for Holland Smith. He says Holland styles himself a lead from the front kind of person, yet never visited the front lines of 27th Infantry at Nafutan or during the attack northward, confined to headquarters three miles to the rear, studying inaccurate maps that bore no resemblance to frontline reality and loathed even to extend the courtesy of speaking face to face with the man in whom he had apparently lost confidence he nonetheless felt qualified to question the courage and competence of an entire division of soldiers and its commander. Holland Smith also does have some contempt for the army in general, as opposed to my marines, as he calls them. Though historical posterity still tends to see the conflict between the two Smiths as emblematic of differing doctrinal philosophies between the Marine Corps and the army, the truth is that the core of the conflict was Holland Smith himself. You can make what you want of this, and whether you believe McManus or historical posterity, but Holland really has fostered a poisonous environment between the two service branches that has stoked old rivalries and resentments and paved a path towards major conflict. Jarman finds when he takes over that half of his battalions are attached to other formations, mainly the 4th Marine Division. He asks for them back, and Holland tells him he'll get them back when they demonstrate that they can fight. Now, on July 7th, the Japanese on Saipan launched the largest bonsai charge of the war, and it becomes a huge bloodbath. Well, after that, Holland Smith accuses 27th Division of outright cowardice. He also says there were no more than 500 Japanese attacking the first few hours, which again is just plain not true, and that the cowardice imperiled the 10th Marine Regiment artillery who were forced to stop the attack and then save the infantry. 
He sends the second Marine Division to take over and has stuff like the following to say, importantly, not just to the staffers, but also to the media about 27th Division. They're yellow. They're not aggressive. They've held up the battle and caused my Marines casualties. I'm sending the 2nd Division through them tomorrow, and I hope the 2nd doesn't get into a fight passing through. I'm afraid they'll say, you yellow bastards, as they pass through. If you think this attitude rubs off on those under Holland, then you are correct. Junior officers are overheard saying the Japanese broke through without a shot being fired, and that 27th Division officers would be court-martialed for neglect of duty, which again are things that are not at all true. Okay, but why go over this again? I mean, sure, some guys in the armed forces are dicks. What's the point? Well, Robert Sherrod is a correspondent for Time magazine, and he covers the fighting on Saipan. He is also Holland Smith's personal friend, and he writes things like this to his editor about Saipan. If we had sent three army divisions to take this place, we'd still be fighting for a beachhead, which is pretty prejudiced. And when he does actually have a chance to spend time with the 27th on Saipan, he flat out says he'd rather go back to the real professionals meaning the Marines. This is still no overall big deal. But then, on September 18th, comes his article in Time magazine about the firing of Ralph Smith. Sherrod claims that at Nafutan, Ralph Smith's men froze in their foxholes. For days, these men were held up by handfuls of Japs in caves. He also writes that during the Banzai attack, the 27th broke and let some 3,000 Japs through in a suicide charge which a Marine artillery battalion finally stopped at great cost to itself. So, Sherrod basically tells the United States that the 27th are incompetent cowards. Thus begins the shitstorm. The 27th are literally stunned, wondering how anyone could write such an article about men who had braved hell fighting for their country. The press liaison during Saipan calls Sherrod a one-man marine lobby. Sherrod told several correspondents he wasn't interested in seeing the 27th. You can probably hazard a guess as to the volume of angry letters Time magazine gets, and Sherrod, now back in the States, gets threats of physical harm, or at least the implication of it. There are pretty high up army brass who write to their congressmen about this, but beyond a backlash to Time Magazine or to Robert Sherrod, this provokes a great deal of resentment among the 27th Division against the Marines. A major writes, most anyone knows that they are publicity hounds of the first water. If just one Marine goes ashore, they immediately take credit for the whole operation. Of course, others go so far as to claim that if the 27th hadn't been there, the Marines would have been driven from the island. Quoting McManus yet again, I will say that despite his anti Holland Smith vitriol, he writes a very succinct and descriptive account of all of this. Anyhow, the humiliating pain of the allegations soon affected family members, especially among the kin of dead soldiers, who began writing searching letters to 27th Division headquarters almost in hope of reassurance that the lives of their loved ones had not been squandered at the altar of incompetence or negligence. This goes further up the ladder. George Greiner, who takes over command of the 27th Division from Jarman, writes a rebuttal to the editors of Time that your distortion of the facts and your circulation of an unwarranted reflection upon the valor of the hundreds of American soldiers who gave their lives in your defense deserves the condemnation of all fair-minded people. He says to General Robert Richardson, responsible for Army Supply on Saipan, that he's not going to lead 27th Division into battle without something done to clear the division's name. Richardson, who is the ranking officer in Pacific Fleet Commander Chester Nimitz's command, goes to Nimitz to see what can be done, even to the extent of revoking Sherrod's credentials. Nimitz, who already has a good opinion of Ralph Smith, agrees with Richardson about the whole affair, goes to U.S. Naval Chief Ernest King and says Greiner's letter should be published and the Department of the Navy should issue an official statement that they have full confidence in the 27th Division. King, though, won't have Sherrod's credentials revoked, since he complied with all censorship regulations before he published his article. And King takes no stance on publication or not, which probably is outside his control anyhow, of course. But he is against the Navy issuing such an official statement, since that would undermine Holland Smith. 
kind of backtrack for a minute. Richardson was upset at Ralph Smith's firing from the beginning, and he has never liked Holland Smith, whom he considers unsuitable for corps level command. And already July 4th, Richardson put together an Army investigative board under General Simon Buckner to decide whether the firing was just or unjust. Holland Smith calls it a kangaroo court, but the Buckner board meets nine times in July, goes over a bunch of official reports, and talks to a bunch of eyewitnesses. Their report from August 4th says that while Holland Smith technically had every right to relieve Ralph Smith, he was not properly or fully informed about the conditions that faced 27th Division when he relieved him, so the firing was not justified by the facts in the case. Holland thinks the board is just biased against the Marines and against himself, but a bunch of Army officers now see this as a cover-up, actually absolving Holland from blame they think he totally deserves for the whole affair. Roy Blount, a member of the board, will later claim the rest of the board don't allow him to use damning evidence he has against Holland, nor to file a minority opinion. Right. Well, after this blows up in time and gets as far as Ernest King, King suggests that Holland Smith write a statement of confidence in 27th Division, which isn't going to make anyone happy because they're not going to buy it. But King really wants the whole thing to just go away. You can't have huge inter-service squabbles in the middle of a gigantic world war. Ralph Smith, who had been transferred to the 98th Division in Hawaii, is soon sent to Europe as military liaison to Charles de Gaulle's new French government. Smith is fluent in French and apparently knows a great deal about French culture. A bunch of army generals, however, state that Holland Smith should never again command U.S. Army troops. Even Greiner, who took over 27th with a fairly neutral attitude towards Holland Smith, now writes, he is so prejudiced against the army that no army division serving under his command, alongside the marine divisions, can expect that their deeds will receive fair and honest evaluation. King realizes that there is no chance any future joint army-marine operations under Holland Smith will be harmonious. So, with fairly enthusiastic approval from Nimitz, Holland is kicked upstairs to command the fleet marine force, which is mainly administrative. He is furious, particularly towards Nimitz, but, like King, Nimitz had vast responsibilities, and he inherently understood the vital importance to the war effort of working harmoniously with army colleagues, a concept that Smith never really grasped. Most likely, Nimitz had come to realize that Holland Smith was nowhere near worth the considerable baggage that inevitably accompanied him. The Pacific Fleet commander was only too happy to save himself the unwanted drama of any more infighting. Holland Smith will command Task Force 56 during Iwo Jima, but during the planning for the invasion of Okinawa, although both Admirals Turner and Spruance want Holland to command the invasion forces, they are overruled by Nimitz because of either personal animosity to Holland or that of so many army higher-ups towards him. Simon Buckner commands that invasion instead. Nimitz himself writes a letter to Greiner expressing full confidence in the 27th Division, but its reputation for failure stays with the division even beyond the end of the war. Holland Smith will stick to his opinions too, and even in 1948 will write in the Saturday Evening Post an article called My Troubles with the Army on Saipan. Richardson will write a rebuttal in the Post two weeks later. The real problem with all of this is that the Marines and Army fought very well together on Saipan and did so with mutual respect. The Marine Corps official history about Saipan will one day read, Marines and soldiers fought a hard campaign side by side. On the battlefield itself, there was neither place nor time for inter-service rivalry. The measure of value was how well each man stood his share of the common burden not what his uniform color was when he stood clear of the mud and the dust. In truth, there could be no other answer to success in combat than inter-service cooperation. I was going to end there, but thought I'd throw in this little piece of trivia that Ralph Smith will die in 1998 at the age of 104, the last surviving U.S. general officer to serve in the Second World War. 
If you want to see that special I mentioned about the Yugoslavian coup and the British, you can click right here for that. And to get more of these specials, you can join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. See you next time.